What's up, fam? We have a special podcast here today. Wednesday Martin, Whitney Miller. They're actually really running the show today. We are. And uh, so I'm just going to sit back and let you guys chat and then just, you know, kind of chime in <laughs> when I feel necessary. You have Girls to say day. a few things. <laughs> yeah, I do, right? A little bit. <laughs> One or two. But I'm, this is, I'm so excited about this podcast because... I've been kind of fangirling over you recently since Aww. your book release of Untrue. Like I told you, I've had all of my girlfriends read it. I People love that. have called and texted me saying that they were crying just reading the very first parts of it, oh, the introduction, man. because it makes them feel like they're not alone, that they're not crazy, and that things are normal. Oh, that's really good to hear. Thank you. There, we talked about this a little bit before. There's like no greater gift than people loving your book and telling their friends about it. That's powerful. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad they feel validated. That's like my uh, mission in life. Use social science and science to help people, especially women, feel like they're normal. Well, you're crushing it. I can oh, tell you, you that. <laughs> thank and you. And that was something that I noticed when I first started reading the book, too. I was sitting on the plane next to Aubrey, and I was reading the part about, you know, a lot of people that you were interviewing for the book were saying, I feel like I'm alone. That you can walk into mm -hmm. a room and nobody, you, you, they can't talk to any of their friends and family. They just look at them like outliers. Right. And that's how I was feeling. And I just remember turning to, towards Ah being like, oh my God. Mm -hmm. Like if I could write any book, this would be the introduction of it. She's like literally talking about me. <laughs> I was. I was literally talking you were, about you. <laughs> you. I knew you guys were in cahoots. We were Is this book even time. real? Is this just something that you manifested? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, the book is about, obviously, women who don't want to be monogamous. They're either doing it on the DL or they're being open about it. But I think you're right. Those women feel really isolated. They feel like there's something wrong with them. They're kind of violating two rules, right? The first rule they're violating is the rule that monogamy is what healthy, mature um, people do. It's the right choice. And then the second rule they're breaking is the rule that, you know, monogamy is somehow easier for women and more natural for women. So I think they feel kind of like double rebels and th that can be really isolating. But I think that when it comes to female sexuality, just in general, women still feel pretty isolated about their sexualities. And so many women um, that I would interview would kind of confide to me in the beginning, like, I'm, I'm not sure you even want to talk to me. Mm. And I would say, why is that? And say, well, I'm like, I'm really weird. Like they were afraid they were going to mm. throw the data. So I said, okay, well, what's weird? You know, well, I have a really strong libido for one thing. And um, I just find monogamy really hard. And I just thought, okay, if so many women are telling me that they have a really strong libido, and if so many women are telling me monogamy is really hard, I mean, granted, it was an N of 30 women, but that's a pretty good sign that we just need to revisit our language and our beliefs about what's normal for women. So that's kind of what I tried to do in Untrue. Use science and social science to show women how wide the range of normal is and how female infidelity is like pretty normative worldwide. 133 cultures, there's not a single one without female infidelity. So, wow. And yeah. you mentioned that that's even in places where the penalty for female infidelity is death yeah it'll still and it still shows up it still shows up i mean look there's a range you know there's no one way any of us are but we certainly cannot say that women are less sexual than men or that they're less driven um, by a sense of sexual adventure the new science is really exciting um, the new sex research in primatology and anthropology it's all showing us that not just that we have to start rethinking who women are sexually and what they want, but we have to start rethinking who women are, period, based on all this new research. And yes, you're right. I mean, a lot of women are really driven by the quest for sexual variety and sexual novelty, and they will take tremendous risks to get it. And this isn't a story we've really been telling about women. We've been telling the story that, like, they're the kind of anxious guardians of monogamy and men are the adventurers. But part of Untrue is helping women who are sexually adventurous feel comfortable with that and own it and feel entitled to sexual adventure. And that's what's so exciting about it because this is, people don't have to hide. And they have, now you're creating this whole community where, where people are realizing that this is normal and this is okay to feel that way. 
because we've been taught, well, you're supposed to be in the home and you have to sit here and you're not supposed to look at Aubrey's hot best friend or want him. <laughs> you're not supposed to do these things. And it's like, wait, who? Wait, what's the, uh, what? Are we, am I'm sorry. learning things? <laughs> what? Oops. <laughs> Kyle? <laughs> But it just gives people like a place to feel okay about it all. And that's why I think this book is huge and so important, not only for women, but for men to also dive into and read about. Yeah, I think you want to start a conversation for everybody. You know, um, people said to me like, oh, it's a book about female sexuality. I mean, it's funny because millennials now just interrogate all those categories in ways that somebody my age might not have so that's been really instructive but I think whatever your your orientation or wherever you identify however you identify knowing more um, about this new sex research and the new findings in science um, can be really helpful to everybody Um, people are at a loss a lot of times I don't know if you remember being a kid and asking all the wrong people to give you information about sex and then you just got really weird information Mm -hmm. and um, (laughs) So this book, um, I mean, what's happened is science has given us really bad information for many, many decades, maybe a co- better part of two centuries now. Science has given us bad information. And our sexual education in this about country. About who women are. Yeah, so men beyond. and women both. I mean, bad science is harmful to men and to women. Um, you know, bad science sort of brought us to a crisis point, I think, where we believed that it was natural for men to be more aggressive and to be predators and all this stuff. And... You know, that was uh, very handicapping for men as well as women. So the new science is really cool. Um, And I get into that science in Untrue. It's fun stuff. I think we've splashed, you know, as we've been public in the forum about our open relationship. And whenever we talk Mm. about it, as humble and as open as we talk about it, we splash into some of these ideas that are really challenging. And this idea, and it's largely men who find themselves the most triggered, typically on the responses Mm -hmm. that I get and the response comes and it's angry you know and it's Mm -hmm. and it's challenging this idea that if they want they want to believe that if they are providing you know this superior macho version of sex which they think that they are able to solely provide that their woman will be completely satisfied and never want sex elsewhere and if they and if she does then that means that they're not performing that something's right. wrong or they're yeah. failing and you know it's interesting a study came out as long ago as 1985 glass and Wright were these researchers who came out with a study that helen fisher the anthropologist mentions in her own work um, that as long ago as 1985 it was out there in the research and in the more mainstream press that over a third of women who are married and having affairs described their marriages as happy or very happy and that really flew in the face of our belief that women only step out or women only sort of refuse monogamy if they're unhappy in their relationship mm-hmm. um, and that kind of data just kind of sat there for a long time and I think it was because it made people really uncomfortable to consider that they needed to rethink this idea that like women only cheat for emotional intimacy (laughs) and men only cheat for sex and um, when I interviewed Tammy Nelson um, who wrote the new monogamy and I love her we should talk about her idea of the Mm -hmm. monogamy continuum which is really cool but when I interviewed Tammy she was one of several experts who said to me men and women's motivations for cheating you know don't break into a simple gender binary you know A lot of men are cheating for emotional connection and plenty of women are cheating just for the sex. So back to this thing about men feeling like it's somehow a reflection on them. Sometimes women just want some variety and novelty. Um, In fact, we know that uh, if anything, they're kind of wired for it. And the question becomes, okay, how will we do this? How will we how will we get women the variety and novelty and adventure that they need every bit as much as men do? And I believe more. And how horrifying to the men who saw that study and had the option to publish it. And they're saying, well, wait, 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 my <laughs> wife could be happy and still want to fuck somebody else. Oh, no. no. Oh, no. Say it's not true. Right. Let's bury this study at the bottom of the yeah. Pfizer pile. <laughs> you and, know, that, yeah. This isn't going to get published. Yeah. It was probably pretty upsetting for a lot of men. And I think the the reason that it, I can see why it would be especially upsetting for men. And you can also see how it was just like 
one of those findings from the sex research over the last decades that didn't just upset individual men, but that really disturbed the entire structure that we had built about who men and women are, right? So that finding, um, the finding that when we measure libido the right way, the female libido is every bit as strong as the male libido. For decades and decades, we believed that androgen and testosterone were the main drivers of our libidos. And of course, men have more than women. And so of course, men have stronger libidos. And then along comes Rosemary Bassin. And she says, wait, like there's not just one kind of desire. There's not just spontaneous desire where you're just sitting there and suddenly it's like, I want to have a hamburger. Like, I want to have sex. It just comes to you, right? That's spontaneous desire. And if you measure spontaneous desire, men do have stronger libidos than women. But along comes a female sex researcher, and she says, I think there's this other thing going on. There's triggered or responsive desire. And that's when you're sitting there and you're not thinking about sex, but then you, like, watch an episode of Outlander or somebody goes like this to your arm or somebody gives you a really lustful glance on the street, a stranger, then you're interested in having sex. When you measure triggered or responsive desire, um, the female libido is as strong as the male libido. So that was another moment where people had to rethink everything they had presumed about who men and women are, not just sexually but socially. And it's very challenging for people, and there is a fair amount of rage. Um, but there's also this yes. feeling that Whitney and her friends <laughs> had, um, which I'm really glad to hear about, and I hear about from my other readers, which is a lot of women read this book, and a lot of men too, and they feel like they now have permission, um, you know, not to step out or refuse monogamy, or but they just have permission to sit a little bit more comfortably with who they are and what they want. So that's really been the goal of all my writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was I woke up this morning and I was taking a shower and I just riled myself up because I was actually texting my <laughs> other lover and he was like why are we, he listened to our podcast and he was like why are you getting so much heat? And I was just rolling myself up of being like, well, they just don't understand and because it goes against all of the way that they thought it's this it's this is that and it's like it was driving me insane because <clears throat> she goes out to go pee all kind of sleepy and groggy and she comes back from the bathroom <laughs> just a ball of fire. Like, Listen, wow. what, ha- what happened on the toilet in <laughs> Something there? Something big so- happened <laughs> in the bathroom. You're fired up all of a sudden. <laughs> She's like opening all the blinds and like staring out into New York like Wonder Woman pose. <laughs> Hello, New York. <laughs> I'm Let's taking go. you okay. on today. All right. <laughs> but it was just interesting for me and I brought it up to Aubin. You made a good point and, and really what it what it seems like it is is that people humans are very adaptable and we and that's just how we are and so when they see something that's like that they automatically put themselves in that situation to what if this was the case oh my wife could never feel this way or I would never be able to do it so then it's all of a sudden these emotions and insecurities and beliefs that were programmed into us are just spewing out on social media instead of just being like oh wow they have just chosen one way to live right and that has nothing to do with me other than I'm listening to them about it (laughs) yeah and you know it's it's interesting that you put it that way we are super adaptive like the point I always try to make to people is there's no one way that we evolved to be sexually there is no one way Mm -hmm. um the data is really convincing now that we evolved as cooperative breeders which maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit but other than that there's a whole range of what we prefer what we like and I always like to say we evolved as really flexible social and sexual strategists so what you guys are doing is so comfortably within the range of normal and healthy um because we didn't evolve to live in any one particular thing. We certainly didn't evolve to naturally gravitate toward a lifelong pair bond. That's really challenging. It's really comfortable for a lot of us and we get a lot out of it, but there's a lot that we don't get out of it. So that you decided to go public with a solution that worked for you and that it's so threatening for a lot of people tells me that it's also interesting for a lot of people. I mean, oh, a lot totally. of times, Fascinating yeah, a lot people. of times when people are deeply interested in something and you've connected with them, I've found in my career that when you connect really deeply with people about something, their first response might be, rather than to say that's interesting and relevant, 
to be flooded. And I think that you guys have made a lot of people feel flooded with um, like a response that's controlling them. They don't feel in charge of it. But I think that it's a really good sign that you got to them by presenting something that hooked in to their own desires and, and curiosities. And also deep insecurities and needs for validation. I mean, sexuality has been you know, attached to so many other factors, so many other elements in our life. Like our, my, even for myself, and I'm speaking personally, my own sense of worth as a man was largely determined by my sexual prowess, veracity, what mm. all of these other measures and metrics. Right. So it's not only challenging, just as this is the way that I'm doing things, it's challenging how you actually think about yourself, you know, and, and that's that's when it gets really, really triggering because then it's quite then you're having to surrender certain elements of your ego. And that feels like death. You know, In your ego feels way. like yourself and any right. part of your ego that you surrender, your identity, you surrender. It's a, a small ego death in a way. And I think that's why. Right. You know, people are willing to accept, oh, okay, this is the way you want to run your business. Oh, you got multiple partners. Oh, you got a co op. Oh, you got a board. Oh, you got mm-hmm. uh, all of these different things. But when it comes to love, you know, right. which is an organization of your life and relationship, an organization of your life, no, 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 no. You know, because it means right. way too many more things other than just the simple, pragmatic, okay, well, this will work as a C Corp with this many people on the board and this is how we're going to do it. Yeah. You know, but with relationship, we're given a narrative. And we're given our expectations. And yes. if those aren't met, woo-wee, it's hard. Right. When you mess with the master narrative of how we believe families should be and how we believe sex should be and how we believe relationships will be, you've messed with something big. And I think that the biggest resistance I've ever received in my career was trying to cross over the science and social science about women being naturally suited for monogamy um to your point about people getting really uncomfortable um and having an ego death um it's been funny that it's a lot of times the copy will sail through from my book like we're doing something for a magazine article or for a newspaper they're doing an excerpt and uh it's all the copy is sailing through and everything's fine and then we get to a male editor and on several occasions a male editor has flagged what is this point here that monogamy is every bit as difficult for women as it is for men and perhaps even more difficult where are you getting that (laughs) and you Mm. you send the links to the studies and the the names of the studies and you get a lot of pushback because that particular idea that women need adventure, that women struggle with monogamy as much as men do, and probably more, I would say that's the place in this book where there's the most resistance to that particular idea. And that's because it's one of the foundational ideas of our entire culture, is that men are somehow the ones who are entitled to pleasure and that to get it, they need variety and novelty and adventure and that women don't. So that was work by several sex researchers, um, but one of them, Marta Miana, when I interviewed her for my book, just said very matter-of-factly, um, we have compelling data now that long-term relationships are especially hard, not on male desire, but they're especially hard on female desire, meaning basically that monogamy may well be a tighter fit for women than it is for men. But no matter how much data you put out there about it, there are two responses. One is women saying, yeah, I feel that. That (laughs) resonates with me. And the other response is a lot of men saying, that can't possibly be. (laughs) So that's been one of the most interesting reactions um, for me to the book about that particular assertion. You see it mirrored in the comedic trope, getting lucky, right? Like... (laughs) <laughs> the woman is bored in all romantic com- in all comedies and all kind of public media. Woman is bored and the man has to do something special to basically purchase her sexual desire 
in a weird way, right. which is demeaning to the man and also demeaning to the woman. And it's mm-hmm. this weird thing, but we just kind of accept it. Yeah. But then when it actually comes out as an actual fact and not comedy, not something we can laugh at, we get all offended by <laughs> we it. We get very offended you know? But like, it's it's really weird place that we find ourselves in where we're comfortable enough with the phenomenon that we can laugh at yeah. it, but not comfortable enough to actually look at it open-eyed with awareness and go, oh shit, what does this mean? What does it mean that it feels like I'm getting lucky when my wife wants to have sex with me. And you know what I think that's linked to that, just exactly that analogy and that way of thinking about heterosexual sex. I mean, we should talk about gay sex and sexual fluidity. I'm sure we will, but right now we're talking about straight people. It's funny how that gets mirrored and reinforced in the science. For many, many years, we had this idea in science that like the egg was this, singular costly super choosy thing it was basically like sitting at the bar filing its nails waiting for a bunch of randy cheap sperm to come and buy it a drink Just elbowing each other yeah, out exactly. shots of whiskey <laughs> and the egg is passively sitting there being pretty and um waiting and choosing the one best sperm now we've revisited that science and we know that that process is very different from what we were taught that eggs the egg is a lot less passive um choice is a lot less passive um the egg is very active in figuring out which sperm is better um and you know people should just go look at the science we won't get into it in big depth here but i think it has done men a big disservice that they've been basically taught that their gametes are like dogs Mm. right (laughs) like sperm are like these randy cheap dime a dozen dogs <laughs> and eggs are you know <laughs> precious and choosy and coy and passive that's done everybody a disservice and amazingly the science is showing us that that really basic presumption is untrue and there's so much more that's untrue can i give you your gift now oh yes yeah. to talk Absolutely. about what else is untrue <gasps> okay you might already know all about this do i have to put it in my butt no, I don't know all about it. <laughs> you no, don't? I, I don't? But I feel know. like this is a <laughs> vagina. Okay, so and you okay, so Whitney thinks it's a vagina and I Aubrey have, thinks I don't have to put it in my butt. For anal as long play. As I don't have he to put thinks it in everything my butt. is for anal play. Let's <laughs> first off, let's get that right. <laughs> Not just my the, anal play. I'm terrified of that. Like, although I realize that's like, an area that I need to grow with. Um um is it the clitoris or that something? That is the... Yeah. yeah. Okay, my favorite thing ever was I used to do these salons before Untrue came out, and I would bring this out and ask usually big groups of women what they thought it was, and one woman was like, I think it's a mouth guard. <laughs> <laughs> and that was my favorite. But yes, you're right. Uh, this, ding, is ding, the, ding. this is the human I female clitoris. clitoris. So like speaking about how we didn't even get gametes and sperm right exactly, we got the clitoris totally wrong. So... Most of us were taught that this is the clitoris, just this little mm-hmm. tiny dot here, right? Some yes. people call it the button euphemistically. And that's the part of the clitoris that you can see with the naked eye. And we were taught that that's your clitoris. That was untrue. This really super awesome female urologist in Australia named Helen O'Connell um, was doing surgeries. And she had been taught, look, when you're doing a, a urology surgery on a man, you have to be really careful not to cut the nerve supply to the penis. And all urologists understood that. Really good advice and really important. We don't want to impinge on male sensation when we're doing urologic surgery. We don't want to mess with that. So Helen O'Connell said, now what about the nerve supply to the clitoris? And basically everybody looked at her and said, what are you talking about? And she said, how do I avoid cutting off the nerve supply to the clitoris? And they said, we don't know. Why don't you find out? Um, so, what? Oh so, my God. Yeah, I know. So nobody was looking into that. We're getting her riled up. Again. Getting riled, riled, up riled up again. Don't again. worry, it has a happy ending. Okay, great. And, Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> we were just talking about happy endings. So <laughs> with very little institutional support and very little funding, she went on a quest to figure out what the clitoris is. And she said, I, I don't think it's just this little thing. And she did imaging when she was doing surgery. She had a look. She did three-dimensional imaging, and finally she found out that the clitoris is hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times larger than we've been taught. It is this vast kind of super highway. Look how big it is. And so for those of you who are just listening to audio, there's this kind of 
hook system, hook part of the it's clitoris. It's like a wishbone, right? Yeah, like, like a, a wishbone. double wishbone. Mm -hmm. That comes over and that's where the hooded clitoris lies. But then beyond that is like this double wishbone with these kind of looks like uh, two different prongs and those little yeah, dangly wings, things that you find that? at the end of your throat maybe yeah. that mm -hmm. are going down. And the whole thing is like four inches in length and maybe four inches or three inches across. I mean, yeah. it's a Isn't massive the tissue network. It's that's about in 10 centimeters. Your, your throat the same as some of the tissue that's in your vagina no. as well or something? Well, the tissue that's in the penis is the ah. same, very similar to the tissue of the clitoris. This is all um, in an embryo. This all starts out as the same stuff and then it just differentiates. But this clitoris, like the penis, it has a glands. It has a foreskin that you can peel back. All of this is erectile tissue. This, these are called the vestibular bulbs. They're underneath the woman's labia. And these are called the crura, and they're these like beautiful uh, winged things um, like a wishbone that go back toward a woman's anus. Okay, the whole deal is probably about 10 centimeters, but women pound per pound and ounce per ounce have as much erectile tissue as men do. Um, women mm. wake up every morning with a heart on. When a woman is aroused, she gets an erection. So something to think about. Okay, you guys, we put a man on the moon. We sent a rover to Mars, and we mapped the entire human genome before we figured out what the clitoris is that most bit she's looking so mad right now <laughs> I'm like before we figured what? out this most basic thing <laughs> about human female sexual anatomy and now we know and that's the great news and the other lesson here is it took a female scientist to have the sort of empathy and curiosity and that kind of focus for her science that kind of scientific curiosity for us to find this out so the more women move into sex research primatology anthropology the more we're going to amplify um, our big picture of human sexuality we'll have a good picture not just of male sexuality but of female sexuality and i i feel like all this kind of research um, is helping us understand not just who women are better but who men are too so a lot of what you have been taught about female sexuality is untrue Starting with the clitoris, what we were taught was untrue. Yeah, it's an exciting I, time. That's it's the, very exciting. That's the, even though you look mad. <laughs> no, it's very exciting because I mean, look how big my clitoris is. Oh, really, <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. You're, you're just you're just swinging your big old clitoris around. I'm just now. swinging around. You're just gonna be dancing around. I'm gonna like, have a yeah. lady boner every morning. <laughs> yeah, and there's a great Hello, book. New York. There's a great book um, by August McLaughlin called Girl Boner about this. And there's um, a visual artist um, named Sophia Wallace. She has a. a movement called the hashtag is clitoracy um there's a sidewalk artist called laura kingsley and she um does beautiful sidewalk art to educate people about the clitoris so i'm going to give you this three-dimensional <sighs> model I'm of the honored. human female clitoris if people want they can get um three-dimensional yeah you can wear it as a necklace you get, make a gold one wait they have them yeah they have oh. gold <laughs> necklaces that looks little, good no, thank you bad. so if people want their own three-dimensional model of the clitoris they can get the specs um from an article in the atlantic just google three-dimensional specs clitoris atlantic oh. and you can oh. 3d print your own human female clitoris oh wow and and surprise your friends and family at Christmas Holidays. is coming, <laughs> you guys. Christmas is coming. I, I think as you, as you talk about this kind of the science that's been untrue, I think people always hold science to the standard that whatever is the norm, norm, normal opinion that's out there, the mm -hmm. consensus opinion that, that's out there, well, that's obviously right because it's the consensus opinion. And because it's science. And because it's science, and, right? Or and, social science. Uh -huh. And then, but you see these things change constantly. Yes. They evolve constantly. Science is always evolving. It is. It's a conversation that unfolds between scientists and between scientists and their cultural moment. Um, yeah. Yeah. In, in every way. And I remember, you know, I was one of the earlier people talking publicly about the medicinal use of psychedelics. Right. And I remember when I would come out and I would talk about that, everybody would just blast it. Oh, what is this woo-woo, druggy bullshit? Why don't you get addicted to more drugs, you hippie, blah, blah, blah. Like, this was the narrative. And eight, now the eight, FDA is running <laughs> right. clinical trials, Run it, yeah, right? Yeah, supporting clinical trials. For fast depression. Fast tracking, you know, psilocybin, fast tracking MDMA, fast tracking these drugs because they're so effective. Yeah, they're so medicinally. effective. Medicinally. That the yes. government itself is now endorsing these trials and helping them 
exacerbating speeding them through yeah. through the thing and, and i think that's one of the things that this book is early in some right. ways because it's shedding light on something that people you know it's against the norm but my, then my book is the, my normal. book is the psychedelic drugs of books <laughs> yeah. about female sexuality. it's the ketamine did you know that ketamine is now being used to treat ptsd yeah mm -hmm. i'm I'm looking, I'm asking you guys, you're like, yeah, we knew that. Yeah, we, <laughs> well, we've tried it. Yeah, we've tried it. Um, yep. Yeah, so you're right. I mean, to, that's a great um, analogy to use about psychedelic drugs and how they were so stigmatized for so long and they were just part of a subculture. But once medicine gets interested in that, once the subculture breaks trail and does the trailblazing, you know, subcultures often really open up the way for scientists. Um, and so now we're in a very different situation. And I hope we'll get there with the science about female sexuality. I hope that women's actual sexual and social behaviors on the ground, like for example, women are to hear a lot of experts talk about it and people um, in these communities, women are probably leading the polyamory movement in meaningful ways. Um, into their mid 40s women are cheating it's a term i don't like but women are refusing monogamy um and practicing uh undisclosed non-monogamy at the same rates that men are um women you know need variety and novelty according to all this new research coming out um, and I hope that at a certain point, in the same way that we're able to say that psychedelic drugs can be really helpful in teaching depression, I really am hopeful that at a certain point um, we'll see women behaving in the ways that we always have, um, but that we had to hide. And we'll say, yeah, what do you expect? Um, she's a woman being a woman. And, you what, know. <laughs> what's a <laughs> prediction that you would say on how long until we reach that point to where we either reach critical mass or it becomes normal almost and and we're supporting these ideas of women being a woman woman being a woman oh well a couple things like when we talk about for example polyamory or open relationships which you guys are in an open relationship and you're really helping destigmatize that which is important um, when we talk about that I did interview some experts and say you know what do you think is the future of monogamy and there were different answers. One sex researcher that I spoke to said, you know, uh, that she believed that in the same way that LGBTQ activism um, had helped people make huge strides and changed marriage, um, she felt like the polyamory movement might eventually be changing our concept of, like, like look, who deserves legal protections? Who deserves to be able to call themselves a spouse? She was saying, why should it just be people in a dyad? And she was hopeful that that was going to start shifting in the same way that we had gay marriage, that we might now be seeing, you know, the marriage of triads or um, thruples, some people call them, and quads. And there was recently in South America, I can't remember exactly where, um, three men recently were allowed to get legally married, which was an interesting moment. On the other hand, I interviewed... That sounds a, like a party. That sounds like a party. <laughs> three For gay sure. men married. God, I would um, like to go to that. Yeah. <laughs> if there's any be, three gay men getting out there married, just, yeah. I'll take an invite. <laughs> I don't remember if it was Columbia, um, something for us to look into. But I interviewed other experts who said, guess what? The monogamous pair bond is not going anywhere, anytime fast. Um, one expert said to me there is not going to be some big monogamy revolution. She didn't believe that. And she felt that the reason was that it's so deeply entrenched in our culture on the one hand. But the other reason, and, and we probably all of us sitting here understand this too, is that, you know, the committed dyad is a really comfortable, cozy, beautiful place for a lot of people. Not forever and not every day, but there's a lot that a lot of us get out of it. So it's hard to predict the future, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't see us uh, letting go of monogamy anytime soon, but I do see us as a culture wanting to ask more and more questions about it and getting more and more curious about our options. Um, one of the things I wrote about in Untrue is that in a Gallup poll, I believe in 2013, 91% of people polled said that they thought that infidelity was always wrong, basically. And yet, um, between um, 2006 and 2015, 
Amy Moores, uh, who's this ex researcher and Kinsey Institute fellow, did this study about our online searches and that terms related to polyamory and consensual non monogamy um, and open relationships shot up exponentially in that period between 2006 and 2015. So, are we still really attached as a culture to monogamy? Yes. Are we curious about our options? Oh, hell yes, we are. And I think that has been a very real shift. I think that's that's great. Um, I don't think, I think some people want to be monogamous, and I think that's beautiful, and I completely celebrate that. Um, I think it's like you said, people are becoming more curious, and I think the more curious we are, it opens our ideas of what relationships can be. And um, hopefully what what I hope from like sharing our message in an open relationship or an unconventional relationship container is that it's really about expressing what you want in your relationship with one another, your desires, your thoughts, everything, and um, creating the best relationship for you personally, knowing that there's not just one way. You don't have to be in this box of monogamy. Right. We and, if mm-hmm. you, and if you, <coughs> another really, I think, important thing is if you choose monogamy, understand it's a choice and and for like so really long really know yeah. that it's a choice and, and it's a beautiful so long, choice yeah, but know that it's a choice know that it's a choice and for a lot of people it's not a choice yeah. for a lot of people it's a false choice and i want women especially to really think about that i if i had one goal it would be for women for whom it's not physically dangerous to feel entitled to have a conversation about whether they wanted monogamy or not and to have a conversation with themselves too to feel entitled to have a conversation with themselves about whether they really wanted this or it was a fallback decision. And also I think for people to understand that it changes. You might like monogamy for a while and then you might need a different solution and then you might want to go back to it. Um, There are these two really interesting German studies from 2002 and 2006. You're smiling. Do you know these studies? No, but I'm excited. Okay, (laughs) it's this guy named Dietrich Klausman and he's at the... Um, University of Hamburg so the first group of people that he looked at were college students and then he went back and looked at adults I believe up to age um, 45 so anyway it's a range of adults not just young people and not just older people but the whole range and he looked at them all over the course of 90 months which is a pretty good longitudinal study and here's what he found among all of them he studied committed heterosexual couples so they started out in their relationships they both had similar layer levels of desire when the relationships started out like right up here up high right you know what sex insanity is right it's like it's also called limerence it's that phase in a relationship where everything's new and exciting and you want to have sex all the time poly people call it limerence I call it sex insanity all right so everybody (laughs) at the beginning of their 90 month period men and women alike started out with their libidos really high like this and and equal and then here's what happened over the course of 90 months the men's libidos fell off slowly what I'm doing with my finger right now is I'm just showing a gradual decline in libido over the course of 90 months here's what happened to the women in the study they're going like this and then between years one and four bam my fingers down in the sub basement if there is a sub basement in this building <laughs> Female desire falls off more quickly uh, in these types of longitudinal studies. And people used to think that that meant, well, yeah, of course that happened. Women like sex less. Now what the data are suggesting to us is that it's not that women like sex less. It's that they are less able to feel satisfied by having sex with the same person repeatedly. Now, what happens after that fall off at between one and four years? What usually happens is women say, oh my God, I'm a cliche. It happened. My male partner wants to keep having sex with me and I'm not interested at all. I guess I just don't like sex. And the answer is to tell women, no, you like sex. You maybe just don't like the sex you're having. Now, talk to your partner if you want to stay together about what you want to do about that. Back to your point about you know, monogamy 
actually being a choice instead of just a fallback that we decide this is normal and healthy and the best choice. It's not the best choice that the data are suggesting to us for women um, unless you revise it and take steps to address that fall off in desire. And I think that was a huge paradigm shift. Instead of just saying, of course they want to have sex less. They're women. They like sex less. Now these female sex researchers came in and they said, well, wait. It's that because if you ask these women what happened to your sex drive, what you get to eventually is them saying, well, if I were with somebody new, it would come back. But, you know, that's not an option. I don't want to do that. So we have to work we have to work with the data to improve our lives. That's my feeling. I think you can look at a relationship, <clears throat> you know, as sex and pleasure optimization. And I think that should, I think that should be a part of our life. It's one of the beautiful things that we have available to us right. in this human body playground <laughs> that right. we get right, to right. experience, right? So I'm all for putting that up in, in the priority of importance. But there's also ways to look at relationship and look at it as a spiritual practice and as a sadhana. And, and, mm -hmm. and that... In that way, still acknowledging monogamy as yes. a great sacrifice and a great gift where you can come to someone and say, my libido is going to diminish incredibly just because I'm a woman and this is the way the data is. Or let's is. wait and, and see if it and is because maybe I'm an outlier. Does. Maybe yeah. Yeah, maybe you're different. But you know, I'm willing to stay committed to monogamy because this is the spiritual path that I'm willing to take with you. Yeah. And then the man can say the same thing. Look, you know, my desire for variety and my desire for exploration of different people is very strong and I find other people very attractive but as my spiritual practice I'm going to choose monogamy right. with you and that can be a beautiful choice right. that can yield incredibly high spiritual mm -hmm. benefits and it life can. partnership benefits but it has to be grounded in an acknowledgement of the sacrifice that's there and not just the just this expectation like what do you mean you want to have sex with somebody else like right. and get all, and all this offense and all this stuff like and give it as an it intentional for granted. gift exactly. right an intentional gift rather than taking it for granted i you know i want to say a couple things first of all just to back up to um women saying between years one and four um if it happens to them in that time frame i mean the the data suggests that that happens in the aggregate. Every person will be a little bit different. But if it does, not only saying this has happened, but knowing within a couple, this is normal. It's not that it's anything the guy is doing. It's not anything the woman is doing wrong. And that she's a woman being a normal woman if this happens. I think that's an important point. Um, also, so my friend Tammy Nelson, who wrote The New Monogamy, she really blew my mind um, because she, first of all, she is the one who coined this concept. I mean, other people knew about it, but she sort of said really clearly, um, monogamy is an intentional practice like yoga, and you work on it, and you don't expect that it's going to be easy, and you commit to it if you want, if that's what you wanted to do. But I love her idea of the monogamy continuum. The monogamy continuum being... Tammy Nelson believes that monogamy can be everything from you cannot look at porn because that feels like a betrayal to me <laughs> to on the other side of it, oh, sure, you can fuck other people, but we're home base and I'm the queen <laughs> or I'm the king. Everything in between that, she's calling all of that monogamy, but that's the monogamy <laughs> continuum. So I think when we talk about the future of sex and relationships, I think that Tammy's monogamy continuum might come into play and be relevant for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. um, you so know, everyone's just figuring out and coming up with their own definition of what monogamy is anyway. I, I mean, in Tammy's, in Tammy's view mm -hmm. of what we could do, that would be healthy and help us deal with, um, you know, the ebbing of desire, uh, the ebb and flow of desire over time within couples. The other thing to know about women that's interesting is, you know, there's, there's research that shows that our sexual desire um, fluctuates with our menstrual cycle if we're, um, um, you know, premenopausal. So there are, there's so much that we don't know about female desire um, still from either whether it has to do with our hormones or you know how long we lust and why it falls off when it does there's still so much that we don't know but yeah I do think that a concept like the monogamy continuum could really help couples who decide that they you know they want to gut through monogamy together and what you were talking about earlier that you called it sexual insanity oh sex insanity sex when you, insanity. When you I mean it's just 
it's not a technical no, term. No, 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 but it's perfect. So sex and sanity, is that, would you say that that pairs with like NRE, new relationship energy? Like pretty yeah, much the same limerence, thing? Yeah, limerence, NRE, okay. sex and sanity. I'm putting them all, I'm sort of using those terms interchangeably. I love how since the rise of polyamory and open relationships, we have a whole new vocabulary, yeah. right? Like there's jealousy and there's compersion. There's... Um, sex insanity or there's limerence or there's nre new relationship energy i love the way you know language is catching up to all these feelings that people are having when we're in these new social and sexual arrangements i mean through the lens of anthropology these are cultural shifts that are just amazing to have the privilege to view it's mm -hmm. incredible to see and yeah the language changes too it has to change it has to keep up with us mm -hmm. you know there's a <clears throat> i think it's really also encouraging for those who are exploring the poly path or the open path understanding that the what happens that new relationship energy that limerence it has a, a word and it has yes, like a exactly. it, and, it, and it exists you know because even in in relationships in my relationship with whitney you know like understanding that you know her her sexual behaviors with a new partner you know may have may contain you know evidence of that thing that new mm -hmm. car smell that limerence that new relationship <laughs> energy that right. that new thing and of course that makes sense but you got to be you got to watch the ego that'll be like well that just means you love him more <laughs> that just means right. he's better or that just right. means it you know your old news and but just even reading like oh, okay oh yeah this is the limerence period like have the grace have the language. you know have the grace have the language have the understanding to be like oh yeah of course and that makes perfect sense and to feel less alone yeah. to feel permission to have the feelings that you're feeling to feel permission to like really love the limerence or the nre or sex insanity whatever we're going to call it and also to feel permission, you know, as the other partner to say she or he is going through this. There's a term for it. There's a kind of a time frame for it, um, you know, and um, I think having the language is really helpful. What's the time frame? It's the one to four years? or Well, I think that one to four years is what these two um, pretty solid German longitudinal studies found was the period of time in which women kind of grew bored mm -hmm. um, and that it happened more quickly for women than it happened for men okay just let's just take a beat for a second that women bore of monogamy in the aggregate more quickly than men do most people would say that can't possibly be true um, but it seems that it is um, another researcher whose name is Kristen Mark does these great studies. I love her surveys. They're called the Good in Bed Surveys. Mm -hmm. And Kristen Mark is a Kinsey Fellow. And one of her findings was that um, women were twice as likely to report boredom within years one to three of a relationship as men were, and that they were much more likely to report that it impacted their sexual desire. Let's start dealing with it. Women get bored more easily and more quickly the sooner we deal with it the sooner we can address it in creative ways that work for couples if they want to stay together that's my feeling about that and what are some of those ways that you would recommend or that are are people are trying well let's talk about you guys like you know one path for some people is to open up their relationship and um, when I interviewed experts about this, I went into this with this idea, even though I'm a feminist and all that stuff, and I had read some of the data, I went into it with this idea somehow in the back of my head that like, oh, guys want this, you know, oh, and it would kind of rub me the wrong way. Like when I saw videos of poly couples and I would see like a guy with two women, I would be like, oh, I guess this is all for him. Then you start digging into the data and interviewing the experts and they tell you, like my friend Misha Lin, who is the co-founder of Open Love New York and the past president of that organization. It's basically um, a resource and support organization for people in the poly community in New York. I talk to people like Misha or um, therapists like Mark Kalp, who works with poly couples um, in his private practice in San Diego and is a big um, you know, advocate teaching therapists how to support people who are poly talk to those experts and other experts and they say 
Mm, actually, a lot of women are driving the poly movement and a lot of women are coming to me, the therapist, and saying, we're here because we want to open up our relationship. So I was surprised um, by that. So that, okay, so you're on one path, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also interviewed people who said, so you guys kind of do this, well, tell me what you do. Do you we're live with your, th with your third, with your no. third? No. Okay. We live together, but we have, at, at this point, we started off as we're open. And, yeah. And now I think we're more polyamorous because we have relationships outside of our own relationship that involve an emotional component as well. Okay, got it. And is there a hot, and is the hierarchy that your relationship has precedence or is it more like all the relationships um, have priority? So which that, that's something that's been really interesting for us to explore because I think... <clears throat> Originally, there was an idea that we have a special love and that love is a pri and you can measure it and you can put that love in a jar and that jar has to be bigger than everybody else's jar. OK. Right. And, and I actually made a post about that today. Obviously, this podcast won't be out then, but it was about <laughs> wild love and, and trying to control wild love is like trying to put God in a jar and measure it. Right. Like nice. it's just it's just exists. It is there. Yeah. So there's no priority love or, or measurement of love that you mm -hmm. can actually have you however can't put a cap on the you can't put you can a cap have. on it it just it, it exists right. it is what it is but what you can do is create agreements around being a teammate being a partner so i would say we are prime we are primary partners in life mm -hmm. we live together we have a combined mission that we both sweat into right but as far as lovers having to release which hasn't been the easiest thing but releasing the idea of being the primary lover you know, the primary source and exchanger of love. Now, of course, our love has survived and adapted and grown and has the depth of a tree that's been planted seven years instead of the new exciting sapling that's been there. You guys have a big root there. system. We have growing. a root system. Yeah. So there is some unique elements to that. Uh -huh. But of course, the love itself, you know, it just is. And right. it's there and it's wild. And so I think by bifurcating those kind of concepts and saying, no, we don't control the love. The love is wild and it just exists. Right. But the time and effort into our life partnership we're primary in that accord. And that seems to be the place where now we actually, I think both of us feel like we have a real healthy shot at this thing working because we've kind of moved through a lot of the delusional and impossible ideas about controlling and measuring the love that we had with other people. You hear um, people in successful long-term polyamorous arrangements. I mean, that's um, sort of a poly concept that um, you might go from the couple dyad having priority and then you might go to well no all these relationships kind of have equal priority and then it might change again um, but in poly systems if we want to call them that it, it tends to be more that there's not a hierarchy and then in what was traditionally known as open relationships um, you know um, it and swingers, it would be clear that the couple had priority, right? So back to your question about like what can people do? I mean, it depends on your arrangement, but I interviewed people who, and through the lens of anthropology, which is the way I see the world, you just are struck over and over. You go, wow, people are just so ingenious in the way they figure out how to engineer what they need um, if they dare to and if it's important enough to them. So I interviewed um, this guy named that I call Tim in my book and he has a relationship of many many years with his wife Lily and not long after their marriage their open marriage um, they started seeing other people and eventually Lily got really seriously emotionally involved with somebody and now they live together um, but they're not in a polyamorous relationship and their relationship still has priority right but I interviewed other people who said oh well um you know, when our kids, the, uh, again, I just love uh, the creativity of the human, <laughs> the human mind and body. I interviewed people who said, oh, when our kids go off to camp, um, we have all kinds of adventures. So uh, and you're just sitting there going, wow, I just didn't expect that this like <laughs> conservative seeming couple, they seem like they would just be a heterosexual couple I didn't consider that they would do this so I interviewed a range of people who said things like that who said um, we adventure and then they either adventure together or they go off and they adventure separately with the understanding that this 
couple is their home base. I interviewed people who that's their strategy. Um, I spoke to a sex researcher, Marta Miana, who talked about how women really get off on seeing themselves as sexy. And that one of her suggestions, she did a study and she asked men and women, hey, if you were having sex with somebody and there was a mirror. I love this study. Yeah. I what see. percentage of the time would you I be looking it. at yourself and what percentage of the time would you be looking at your partner? And the men, again, a lot of sex research, unfortunately, is still focusing on heterosexual couples. Um, it'll be great when it focuses equally on the LGBTQ mm-hmm. uh, couples and their needs as well. But at, in this particular study, the men said, I'm um, looking at my partner, hello? And then she asked the women, and they're like, oh, damn, I'm looking at myself. And, you know, that is what was sexy for them. So, like, one finding is, okay, like, get a mirror. Like, that can be a way to introduce some variety and novelty and excitement for people. Really simple things like that. Other really simple things for people who want to be monogamous but want to thrill or people who are together long term but want to have that free song with each other. Really simple fixes like when you meet each other for dinner, don't show up together. Show up separately. See your person across the room. Imagine your person as a person you don't know as well. Watch your person doing something that he or she is really good at and maybe they don't know that you're there. Somebody described to me... um, showing up and watching his partner who is an academic give a lecture and that seeing her do that in her element controlling the room was so sexy as opposed to how he usually saw her which is like at home in bed you know reading a textbook or being on their kids together seeing her in her place where she had mastery was like seeing her the way other people who desired her would see her and it's just seemed hot all over again so there are many many creative solutions for people who want to stay together you've you've experienced i think we both experienced some of that where we've seen each other in their mastery oh well that happened to me today (laughs) well because we were at a speech at uh, entrepreneur live and you were giving a a quick like 12 minute talk but it was just I was sitting there in the front row like, damn, he's crushing it. Damn. And he looks good in that white shirt. (laughs) I want that man. Oh, wait, he's mine. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Winning. (laughs) Yeah. And I, it's it's powerful. (laughs) It is. It's really amazing because you look at him and just like see them as just, you want them. And I feel yeah. like everyone else in, in everyone else in the room wanted you too. But no, yes. it's just like there's people that if you see your partner from somebody else's eyes, you know, with fresh You're eyes. You're engineering a way to want what you already have. Right. Yeah. And to see it in a new, fresh way and go damn. And appreciate it and don't and take other it for people, granted. And, yeah. the, and you were like to all the other women in the audience, do not. That is my man. Like, in your <laughs> mind. Hair flip. Right. And, Hello, and, bitches. And, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> So for some people, a really effective way to do that would be to have a third, literally in their bedroom, in their bed with them. But for some people, an effective way to do that, but for some people, that would be too threatening. And they want to just... just get really hot. Right. But, too many bodies. <laughs> and too many, and for some people, that would be too hot in every kind of way. And, and they want to do it the way we're talking about, engineer these scenarios, see your person across the room. Mm-hmm. Um, there, but there are many, many ways to do it. But look, here's what Lisa Diamond said to me. If monogamy were easy, we would not have dozens and dozens of books about how to feel desire while you're being monogamous it's not easy it's counterintuitive and there's a book called hot monogamy and every time i see it i kind of roll my eyes (laughs) (laughs) because i think we have to have books called hot monogamy because after a while monogamy is not hot anymore let's admit that let's admit that there is no scientific model of how we habituate to a stimulus over time how we desensitize to excitement over time that fits the model of feeling lust for somebody for a lifetime it's just not. It is going to be like almost nobody who lives out a truly monogamous entire life with one person with zeal. Okay, now let's address it. It's yeah. out there. How are we going to deal let's with it? Let's take a real look right. at it. I think we're in a unique position, and you can talk about it from your perspective too because we had two years of monogamy, and you know, and then we've had five years in poly. Or open, you know, depending on the, the definition, how you want to how you want to say it. But we've communicated always, so I guess it's more in the poly, even though we've been using the word open. Explain, you know, how that's been different, the difference between those two relationships. I mean, we have a case n equals one here for us. Mm, yeah. Here an n of two or yeah, one, yeah, however yeah, we want exactly. to look at a couple. 
Yes, a couple you're an N of one, as individuals you're an N of two. Exactly. All right. Next, even, <laughs> Here even we are in our little petri dish. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, we had a great relationship, but you do get restless, and I find myself being a little more agitated and a little more like, Ugh, whatever. Like we're just, I, I, I have for our personal monogamous relationship, I really don't have a whole lot of examples for that because. I didn't get as restless in that one as I did in the past relationships. My past relationships. You're just relation- pumping my ego right now. No, 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 no. It's cool. I'll take it. Just keep going. Tell me how in my monogamous relationship you- all is good. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, carry on. Carry on. Special. Woo. Let's, Let's not take it too good far. Of- okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I would wake up and I would turn over and I would see who, whoever I was dating next to me and just be completely bored and there was nothing wrong with him. And it was a great relationship, like you were saying. We still, it, I would consider it an amazing relationship, but I was just bored and I didn't want to have sex anymore. And the relationship like sad. Thing that's going to stay is the one where you can say to that person, okay, I guess maybe you're not going to say like, okay, I'm bored. But mm-hmm. you'll find a way to say... I need something else and that person will hear you. Right. And the relationship that's not successful is the one where you either feel like you can't say it or you say it and it just falls apart. That's what's so, you know, in a lot, I've started doing relationship coaching for people who are wanting to open up or do any sort of unconventional route because, you know, we've been through it. So I've been trying right. to help them as much as I possibly can. And the number one thing that I keep finding from clients that are reaching out to me is that they just don't feel comfortable voicing what they want. And it's this big, it's a huge thing in relationships. And if you're with somebody that you just, you can't express what you want, then that's like a very foundational issue in the relationship. That's a basic issue. And let's be clear, there is extra stigma for women to say that. So I think it's great if somebody who's coaching um, people in open relationships is a woman because women are the one that the, the, the data are suggesting who really are going to benefit from it and maybe need it first. Um, But they're also facing the most stigma. I have a part of Untrue where I talk about how I was in a relationship with a guy and I really liked him, but I was like in my 20s. I didn't want to be monogamous. And I thought, oh my God, this is going to be a really big dilemma. Like this is a problem. So I turned to my gay friends, two of my gay male friends to ask them like for their advice. And they just looked at me like I was from Mars and they said, (laughs) well, honey, you just say, I really like you, but I don't want to be monogamous, so what about this? And I was like pumped. I was like, oh, right, yeah, I can just say, I really like you, but I don't want to be monogamous. <laughs> yeah, 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 and I'm saying it, I'm like marching over. <laughs> and I, uh, you know, bring it up in, my, in a pretty gentle way, and the man just was very, very hurt and completely really, really upset. So I just decided okay right there's something wrong with me and he's right and we'll just be monogamous later I realized gay male culture you know allowed gay men to have these conversations about it gay men sort of gentrified open relationships for the rest of us the same way they gentrified San Francisco and Mm -hmm. you know the West Village (laughs) Um, so I was really grateful to my gay male friends for giving me that possibility and at the same time it was not yet possible in straight heterosexual couple to go you know couple them to go there so these cultural shifts you know the, the cultural container is can be really limiting and it's great that activists like you who are women are pushing at the edges and opening it up yeah. the social proof is is so important you know and I think that's <coughs> you know people can see me and Whitney connect you know, and we've also we've had our conflict. We've been figuring stuff out, and certainly, but the level of communication that it's this amount of oh, pressure right. like forces it forces adaptation, and that adaptation, forces. as we've discovered, is just the rawest, most vulnerable, introspective truth that we can possibly come up oh, with, wow. right? So yeah. they've seen that social proof, like wow, that's pretty cool. You can mm-hmm. express everything at the very core, you know, heart of everything that you feel. Level that's cool wow and look how passionate they are still physically seven years in and that's true and i think absolutely open and and our poly lifestyle has contributed to that in a massive significant way because we're both free and when we know that each other are free and we have the variety and have our own freedom we come together and with as much 
fire and passion is that very first night we met at the Lowe's hotel and it looked like it looked like a tornado <laughs> came through that room and and sprayed the walls and 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 that was like that moment you know is usually like okay yeah that was the start of the relationship and you could go fast forward 30 years and be like yeah you only get that once and and that's it no but you can regain that right feeling multiple times but you just have to go through the challenge and the hero's journey of releasing a lot of these normative ideas about jealousy and possession and all the things we think and about love. And you have to, to your point, this is a great point, and we talked about it before we sat down too, about communication. Communication is a word that like to me is like the unsexiest word. Like I just, com- when you say communication, my libido just shuts down. I'm like, okay, this is boring. <laughs> but the amazing thing that the research is showing is that people in um, poly relationships, swinger relationships in consensually non-monogamous relationships uh, um, as Mark Kaup who works with poly couples puts it in, and and who teaches therapists how to work with consensually non-monogamous couples as he puts it people who are consensually non-monogamous um, he said they process the crap out of everything there's a lot of talking there's a lot of hashing stuff out and so these people consequently have great relationship skills that not only allow them to do well when they have these relationships with other people it really bonds them to each other so that's a piece of what you guys are doing um that's really impressive and that's giving you longevity first of all you're engineering that feeling of newness and limerence over and over again but it's building on a foundation of seven years of processing the crap out of everything Mm -hmm. and it's you know it's a really strong root system yeah no doubt i think one of the biggest questions we got and then we'll probably have to wind this thing down unfortunately i'd love to go full (laughs) three hour marathon with you um (laughs) but one of the big questions is about kids and when you're bringing Mm -hmm. kids into the picture and i think you know going back to our roots and talking about cooperative breeding you mentioned that word mm-hmm. early on the podcast yeah. and i've been wanting to circle yeah, back to it yeah let's talk about and it and just reframe the idea of human beings raising children right in in a different way not necessarily offering a solution but just talking about how it used to be and how right. it, it successfully <laughs> developed yeah. mm-hmm. you know before all the rules and, and ideas were in place right so what we see when we look at traditional hunter-gatherer populations who likely lived as we did in the Pleistocene and for like, you know, 95% of our evolutionary prehistory. If we look at traditional hunter-gatherer populations who are kind of a time capsule, they tell us how how we were for a long, long time. Um, We see, first of all, that they're pretty radically egalitarian, right? They don't have rigid hierarchies um, or rigid social stratification everybody's kind of on one level Um, men and women tend to have um, very close to equal social clout women tend to provision the group with a lot of its calories um, so they kind of have big say because they bring home the bacon Mm -hmm. Um, and we also see that divorce uh, is often just a case of a woman moving her hammock um, we see that men, you know, is, okay, see ya. Like, that was fun. I'll see you. And, like, do are there hard feelings? You just go back to your palm tree and you're like, oh, damn. That hammock's gone today. The hammock's gone today. Fuck. And there are hard feelings. To war, everyone. <laughs> to, to war. war. No. Nope. Well, what I was going to say is, and there will be hard feelings about that. And then what happens is because the group is so egalitarian, a guy can't coerce his now former wife into doing something she doesn't want to do she's feeding everybody and also she's surrounded by kin and relative and friends and if he tries to get violent with her somebody's going to stop him okay now the other big thing that we see um in these populations is that there tends to be what anthropologists call cooperative breeding it tends to be that a child is not merely raised by its mom and its dad but there's a wider kin network either they live with their extended families or they live in this kind of rangy band and the kid has aunties and uncles and um you know concerned cousins or just um you know friends that they grew up with um children who are older tend to take care of littler children like i said aunties and uncles tend to pitch in this is the evolutionary script um, of the human family it is not what irv devore told us in his book man the hunter uh, in which you know 
the man and the woman and the baby are in a cave and the guy goes off and does some hunting and then he brings it back to the woman and the baby um nope <laughs> what would that that is untrue that was a nice idea that fit sort of the 50s and 60s model of us living in suburban homes look at this nice cave i got you yeah honey. exactly i'll go home and <laughs> slay that buffalo stay here stay right here so that Wait for me yeah that was really informed by how scientists were living at the time they were living in monogamous heterosexual dyads and so they just projected back and chris and casilda and i all write about this they write about it in sex at dawn and i write about it in untrue they sort of projected that backwards and they said well if i have a chrysler in a house and a picket fence they had a chrysler in a house and a picket fence it was just that it was a cave and the guy <laughs> brought the meat back okay no 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 the new uh, data all show us that we evolved in these rangy groups and that it was probably females driving the decision and the reproductive and social strategy that for protection, uh, we lived in rangy groups and we probably mated multiply so that multiple males had skin in the game and felt like, you know, there's a good enough chance that that one's mine that I am going to help out. Mm -hmm. And that was the strategy that helped homo sapiens survive you know while homo habilis bit the dust um one of the reasons that we're here is that the you know hominin females and early human females were really super canny sexual and social strategists and they struck on this breeding and social uh, strategy that really worked and helped kids survive to the age uh, where they could reproduce. Mm -hmm. So we got to let go of this idea that the monogamous heterosexual pair bond is the healthiest way and that it's the natural way and it's the way things have always been. It is the way things have been for 10,000 years. That's like the blink of an eye in terms of how anthropologists see the world. This is all very recent. Monogamy is very recent and that's why we're having a hard time with it. Now, we are super, super flexible social and sexual strategists. And we can adjust to monogamy. We can live with it. We can thrive with it. We can really enjoy it, um, but probably not forever. And it's new and it's a hard adjustment. And we're still in the process of making it. And let's see where we decide to go with it. I think people like you are blazing the trail um, about where monogamy is going. We'll see. <coughs> it's, you know, all these things, I think people need to understand that all these things are just ideas. <coughs> Monogamy is an idea. Poly is an idea. All of them are just ideas. Like it's and possible. Strategies. And strategies. Mm -hmm. It's possible to just remove the emotional binding from all of these ideas and just look at the ideas. You know, like look at, oh, look, the Tahitians had an idea called enveloped in sex, where if someone was sick, they would have the young oh, people. Oh, that's the, the Wendat. Oh, the, the Wendat. Wendat. Mm -hmm. Okay, the Wendat. Yeah, God bless. The Huron Indians. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the Huron Indians. Okay. The Huron so they Native would people. Sorry. They would surround themselves yeah. with other people having sex and it would increase the vitality. Well, I don't know if that's science. I don't know if it did, but it was right. part of the culture and everybody bought in. Right. And it was just normal. It wasn't yeah. like traumatizing. People weren't like, oh, man, we got to envelop the chiefs. <laughs> <laughs> wife and sex today and god damn it you know like I, I can't believe i have to do this you know right. and getting all triggered by it and it's just like all right that was their idea that was a healing ritual that was a healing ritual called be enveloped in sex for me i go into it on true if somebody was sick they yeah. would say be enveloped in sex for me and what that <laughs> meant was i'm feeling sick and i need all the young people of our tribe to come around and the girls need to be the ones who pick the boy they want to have sex with and everybody needs to surround me where i'm lying and have sex all around me yes and that's called being <laughs> i think i'm coming down with a cold <laughs> <laughs> I need to be enveloped in sex. Please. So, but that was sort of part of the cooperative breeding script, right? Yeah. You can see how cooperative breeding would have led to an idea that that not only is that not a bad thing, that's potentially curative. Mm -hmm. to, so I yeah. didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no, it's just an example of like, that was an idea that those people had and they just adopted that idea and we're flexible and adaptive enough yeah. and that we can't come in and judge their idea. Right. It's just an idea. All these things are all just ideas and those yes. ideas can work as soon as we di you know, remove our emotional connection yes. to all of these things that's and just right. look like, oh, that's a cool strategy. And it, Let's yeah. do that. And if we believe, and um, you look at the data and it's hard not to, if we believe that we evolved as cooperative breeders and we have lots of evidence for it now, we have to say that polyamory and consensual non-monogamy, um, not only are they not abnormal, 
they're, they hew more closely to the script of how we evolved than monogamy. So when we're talking about what's normal and what's healthy, um, let's definitely not presume it's monogamy. Let's look at how recent monogamy is, how hard it is for some of us, and how, how wonderful it is for some of us. But to your point, let's make sure when we're making choices um, that we're actually choosing, if we're lucky enough to have that privilege. I mean, I hate to end on a bummer note, but I do always like to say that we have to be realistic about the culture we live in. I was just always raised to believe, oh, you're an American, so free. This is the best place to be a woman. We live in a culture where if a woman exercises the most basic fundamental sexual autonomy by saying, I'm married to you or I'm in a relationship to you, but I want to have sex with other people. In some contexts, like in Austin, in an enlightened circle of people, that will be tolerated. But in some contexts for a woman in the United States, the audacity of exercising really basic bodily autonomy, even if she has left a man, a woman having sex with another man, even if she is divorced, even if she's living on her own, she might incur lethal violence for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, David Lay, the social psychologist, says that the most common cause of domestic violence is a man not having proof that his wife or the woman that he's with has committed infidelity, but just suspecting it. He believes that that's one of the most common triggers uh, for domestic violence. And um, there's there are some data suggesting that aside from mass shootings at schools, many, many mass shootings um, are triggered by men um, going after women who have left them, who have exercised bodily autonomy by saying, I'm leaving, I'm not going to be here anymore. So women still face lethal violence in this supposedly the most enlightened free country in the world for being who they want to be sexually or even personally for daring to leave a man. So I think that I always feel so privileged that I have the opportunity to make these choices and decisions and I always try to remember that for some women um, making the decision to be sexually autonomous is lethal so we have far yeah. to go mm -hmm. and we also need that sympathy and compassion for those men who are so maniacally driven by the external validation of a female that they have no internal sense of worth that's strong enough to withhold the removal of sexual favor by a woman that they go so mad and get so enraged and get so violent you know, and, it, and we're not really talking about that. Like we'll tell all kinds of dates and times and history and all these things in your science book, but we're not talking about like, okay, here are the validation patterns that you have to watch out for. Here are the ways that you can be deeply emotionally unstable if you don't understand who you are at the core and have enough self-worth and self-love mm -hmm. that it's okay to allow whatever partner you're with, male, female, if you're a guy, whatever is going on, that that's okay and that you're okay. And so it's like we're not actually taking any of the basic precautions on either side and it's resulting in occasionally a very dangerous situation. I'm glad you made that point because it's absolutely it's absolutely true. And I think overall, globally in the macro, we got to start encouraging people to take a look at their emotional body and these, these patterns that, that are existing. Yeah, I think you're right. And I think that um, another really important thing is the point that we made earlier which is bogus science about who men and women are doesn't just harm women it, it harms couples it, it harms you know um poly groups it harms individual men and women and people who identify as somewhere in between so i think it's like really hopeful um that this great new science is coming out and that there are people like you who are interested in hearing it and and you're crossing the message over to larger communities thank you for that of course. Thank you for your work. Mm -hmm. Why don't you bring us home? Why don't you, you know, for all the listeners who are reading, you know, you've actually had the privilege to read a little bit more of Untrue at this point. I'm, I'm looking forward to catching up. But talk about the book. Talk about who should read it, why you think they should read it, and, you know, how important it is to get this information out for both males and females. Well, I mean, the whole podcast is about why it's so important. You know, I feel like a lot of the things that we talked about today, people just don't understand. It's it's rewriting and reframing what we actually know and think about women's sexuality and infidelity and, and just the way that we work. And that's why it's been so impactful for me and so impactful for a lot of my girlfriends is because we've all felt what you're talking about in the book. 
but we didn't have any vocabulary for it. We had nobody else that was kind of leading the way. We were just kind of floundering and trying to figure it out on our own. And so a lot of us would cheat and we would feel bad about it because we didn't know what to do. And, and, and it really gave us, like I said earlier, a community all together to feel safe and not alone throughout uh-huh. all of this. Uh-huh. And I also think it's it would be super beneficial for men to read this book as well, just because it's it's going to be educational for, for everybody. And I think it really allows for people to create relationships at the end of the day that they truly desire because they have the science, they have the backing of it and mm. going into the relationship, regardless if it's monogamous or poly or open or whatever you decide, it allows you to go into it as a choice, knowing what is actually going on in your body and, and, and emotionally and sexually. And and it's been a game changer for me. And I think it's only going to continue changing people's lives for the better. I hope so. I hope people feel good when they read the science and social science that shows them that men and women are not that far apart. And that shows men that like the women in their lives are more really like a lot more interesting than you might have thought and that we're not here to shut down your sexuality and and this is gonna just give people even better (laughs) sex lives like read this book and you're gonna understand each other more i mean look how big my clitoris is (laughs) it's giant giant and it's pink but it's like it will create better sex lives for everybody because it's you're just educated at it's, the good, it's good to know who we are. It's great to know who we are. Um, I want to give you guys another gift. Okay. I, these are untrue undies. <gasps> <laughs> Just I, when I'm you so think excited. about how you're so tired of people believing and and promoting stuff about male and female sexuality, it's untrue. These, these are, are gonna look really these, cute see, on the you. Under, undies for you these to wear. Are, these are male undies here. They're, uh, you know, they, gonna, you they, know they, they're unisex. Yeah, I they're think I might unisex. have a little ball hanging out of the bottom here, but you know what? Just so go. I already be, see a might beautiful not be Instagram ins- worthy, but no, it's, you know, insta- it's like a hump day Instagram post. <laughs> yeah, we can do it together. <laughs> yeah, it's a very flattering cut, I'm told. So I hope yeah. you enjoy this. Uh, oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. This is amazing. Yeah, I mean, I think that the final thing I'm saying is like it's a really weird time when we we have these ideas about monogamy that's all fairy tale. Be like trying to teach people how to sail their ship and just saying don't worry as soon as you get to the water it's a lake <laughs> and you just you just have to pick the right coke cap it's a smooth sailing the whole way and then they got in the ocean like fuck oh, it's yeah. choppy right, it's, exactly. it's really choppy. It's choppy out here yeah maybe we need a crew you know like maybe and then you get there a, and you don't know what you're doing you don't you're know what you're like, doing oh yeah. hell so i think this is it's beautiful to get this information out and i love the format and the world and the time that we're in that we're not chained to the academic resources and academia you know, can actually exacerbate and facilitate and then be compiled in books like this and be spread on podcasts. It just really helps speed up this process that at some point might have taken decades, but now can just take months and hopefully years to start to disseminate. Thank you for helping me cross over the science and make it delicious and help people see that the science can really set them free. That's the point. So thank you guys. No doubt. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Thank you, everybody. Get the book, Untrue. Audible, Amazon, hard copy, wherever you want to get it, it's going to be good. See you, everybody. Peace. Bye.